We acknowledge the land we are standing on in downtown Toronto is the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, the Chippewa, and the Wendat peoples. We also acknowledge that this land is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. This is how the city of Toronto recognizes hundreds of years of Indigenous history. When you acknowledge this land and its history, what are you actually acknowledging? Do you know who these nations are? Were you taught about them in school? Do you know their individual languages, cultures, and histories? Do you know the true origins of this city? The history of this land is filled with deceit, betrayal, exploitation, struggle, and resiliency. This history isn't taught in schools. It isn't spoken in courts. For most of the city, this is all but forgotten. But we remember. And this is what we acknowledge. A name is a powerful thing. It reveals something deeper about the place it refers to. It holds history and a wealth of meaning. So do you know where Toronto's name comes from? This river was once a key source of food and travel for the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Wendat people. From Lake Ontario to Lake Huron, it supported game, trade, and the livelihoods of these nations for centuries. The fish were so plentiful, a large fishing weir was built at the mouth of Lake Simcoe. Each nation called the weir by a different name, but it was the Mohawks who called them to Toronto, where there are trees in the water. In the early 1700s, the French and English settlers used the word as the name of Lake Simcoe. After years of clerical errors on maps of the area, the word was anglicized and given to an area at the mouth of the Humber River. When the town of York was established, Lieutenant General John Graves Simcoe refused to name the town after an indigenous word. Years later, when the city was incorporated, it was renamed Toronto. What are you acknowledging when you acknowledge this land? You're acknowledging that the very name of the city was taken from the Mohawk language and stripped of its meaning and history. One of the country's greatest cities, disconnected from its origins, we acknowledge its true history. The right to live on this land called Toronto had been contested for hundreds of years prior to contact. The Humber River's value as a trade route, the fertile farming lands, and proximity to the lake made it invaluable to every Indigenous nation in the area. The British also saw the immense value in this land and were determined to gain ownership of it. In 1787, Sir John Johnston, the Superintendent General of the Indian Department, held a private meeting with Mississauga chiefs near the Bay of Quinte. Accounts of the promises made between the parties during this meeting have conflicted for generations, but eventually a deal was struck between Johnston and the chiefs. The Toronto Purchase was made. When years of border disputes between the Mississaugas and British threatened to escalate into violence, the British discovered that the deed of sale from Johnston was blank. It had no description of the land purchased by the Crown, no account of the amount paid for it, and the marks of the chiefs that agreed to the sale were attached on completely separate pieces of paper. It was an invalid treaty and the land still rightfully belonged to the Mississauga Nation. The British bided their time to address the issue until the Mississauga Nation had been weakened by trade disputes and disease. In 1805, the British negotiated an underhanded treaty with the new generation of Mississauga chiefs for more land than originally proposed in 1787. 250,000 acres, Toronto to King City, sold for 10 shillings. Today, that equals 
What are you actually acknowledging when you acknowledge this land? You're acknowledging the deceitful, manipulative and exploitative tactics used by the British to secure title over these lands through Treaty 13. How can a treaty be honored if its very creation is dishonorable? This land has been marked by tragedy since contact with European settlers. Wabakanin, a Mississauga chief in the late 1700s, was well respected by his people and the British. Recognized as an accomplished diplomat and warrior. After a day of trading with the British at York, he and a small group of his people camped near Sugar Beach. That night, a Queens Ranger, Charles McEwen, and his companions set upon Wabakanin's sister. Wabakanin's wife called out for his help. He confronted the men, desperately trying to fight them off. Before help could arrive, McEwen and his companions assaulted his wife and fled the scene. They both passed the next day and were buried before any of the British had seen their bodies. Wabakanin's murder sent shockwaves through the Mississauga nation. They demanded justice. No peace! No justice! McEwen was brought no before a grand peace! jury where he was acquitted no as no British authorities no had seen Wabakanin's body before he was buried. Tensions reached a fever pitch. The Mississaugas allied with the Haudenosaunee and the British feared a war was imminent. The British spent years manipulating and dividing the Mississaugas and Haudenosaunee with disease and famine sweeping through their communities and their alliances shaken. Hostilities came to an end. What are you acknowledging when you acknowledge this land? You are acknowledging that settler governance has systematically failed Indigenous people and responded to our cries for justice with intimidation and violence since before this country was even founded. Port York is seen as the birthplace of Toronto. Its establishment allowed the British to gain a foothold of power in the area to expand and develop from. But when American forces attacked the fort in 1813, Anishinaabe warriors were the first line of defense, laying down their lives to protect the British and the land from American rule. Today, the site commemorates the foundation of the city from a colonial perspective. Great care has been taken to maintain and present its history for the masses. But what does it tell of the true history between indigenous nations and the British? The Mississaugas allowed the British to settle in their territory. Several Anishinaabe nations, along with the Haudenosaunee, fought alongside the British in the War of 1812. Their alliances allowed the city to flourish. And what is told of our stories? Where does history place us? On land taken from indigenous peoples, we've been relegated to the sidelines. The names of our warriors have been lost to time. Our stories have been ignored by history. We've been viewed as the other, violent, wild, uncivilized, mere relics of the past. What are you acknowledging when you acknowledge this land? You're acknowledging the erasure of indigenous history and identity. Our stories shape the foundation of this city and this land. They will not be erased. We acknowledge that this city, this province, and this country have been built on the traditional lands of countless indigenous nations. We are the original inhabitants and caretakers of this land. Our contributions will not be forgotten. We 
acknowledge our resilience and our continued presence on this land. We have weathered the attempts to erase our past through colonization. Our people's traditions, cultures, languages have and will continue to shape the history of this country. We acknowledge these stories are our collective past, and we all have a role to play in ensuring our future generations have access to their true history and identity. When you think of this land and its history, what will you acknowledge?